Sharma, uh, Bhagavati, to start the discussion. Dr. Thank you so much, uh, Manu, for inviting me, Professor Khan and uh, Dr. Sikandar. It's wonderful to be here. I think the first thing that struck me as soon as I saw the audience in the morning was uh, the, the mix of men and women. Most places that we go and talk about watching the gender, about uh, women and how men, I find there is a predominance of it. It's very, very important to look in the end of the conversation. In fact, yeah. in fact, in the morning when I took a quick round, I saw more men than women, and that's very, very good. So this morning as I was coming uh, on the flight and um, I was running late, I've been consistently running late for the past 30 years to airports. And um, as I was uh, in the security queue, 30 years ago when I started my career, I remember I used to be the only woman and I would just pass the security line, the women's security line. Today, it could be 20 minutes because there are so many more women. Um, it is a wonderful time, as I keep telling my daughter, it's a wonderful time for women to be in working, in workspaces in our country today. And when I partner with organizations in building gender inclusive workplaces, I feel more envy for women. So in the next 15 minutes, then I'm going to clip to you big time about the challenges that we uh, face when we are building gender inclusion in organizations. I want us to remember this, that it is an optimistic outlook. I think it's wonderful that we are all sitting and having these conversations. Um, things are changing. There is a lot of change that's happening, especially brought about by people like you all. So very quickly, and I'm very alert and alive to the fact that we have a uh, really you know, short of time. I'm going to run you through what we do, what are the challenges that we're facing. Uh, my work in the last seven years has been primarily with the uh, Corporates. We partner with them through Parity Consulting. This is a boutique consulting and training firm. We have worked with very, very large corporates, the bigger ones right now, uh, like your Aditya Villa Groups, your Tata Group, uh, Reliance, NIIT, you name them, and we have done work with them in creating gender inclusion. Um, I'm also founder of at the grassroots level. I have an NGO where we give loans to women in. Uh, underserved sections of society. I'm also associated with many other resource, uh, NGOs which do work with women's safety. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is really the opposing pools that we are seeing where, where women leadership is concerned. And if you look at it, increasing number of women getting educated, there is a significant increase in this. I was just talking to Amit. Uh, Professor Khan just now, and he was saying how 60% of in your campus you have women working in India. But uh, interestingly and contradictorily, between 2013 and 2017, more women have dropped out of Indian workplaces. Women are leaving workplaces. We don't know why. There is this educated talent pool that is there, but they are dropping off workplaces. Second, if you look at it, the Center for Work Life Policy, an international body, did research in India and found that women in India are actually reporting the highest levels of ambitions across the world. This was a surprise for me. Having worked with more than 3,000 women across the country, with more than 1,000 managers, uh, that Indian women are reporting such high levels. Again, contradictory, Indian women are also pulled back the most by social cultural experience. There is more and more research showing that more women in workplaces means the performance is higher, the return on equity is higher, uh, increased revenue. But again, there are so many biases, biases and stereotypes in the workplaces. In fact, the latest McKinsey report shows that it is you need to set these biases and stereotypes in place if you want women to grow in workplaces. Another study by McKinsey, they identified nine leadership competencies that are required by organizations, leaders, need for the future. Out of the nine, they found five are leveraged more by women. But again, when you go to the corporate context, there are barely any women. 
at the top you find it to be very true. So this is the context of what's happening. And if you look at the organization's landscape, see gender inclusion in organizations is very young. It's barely the last 10 years, a decade or so that we are seeing people talking about it. That they are engaging with initiatives. Very, very nascent journey. They are all at very initial stages of the journey of creating gender inclusion. And they're pretty ad hoc right now. You just find bits and pieces of initiatives that are being taken, taken on. Uh, an overall strategic perspective not yet in place. Maybe a couple, a handful of them have that. If you look at the percentages of women, overall across industries, across companies, it's about 30%. In fact, if you go to manufacturing, it's far lesser. At entry level, I'm seeing they're trying to bring in more women at about 40%. But as they keep moving up, middle management drops to 22. Goes up further, 14%. And when you go right to the top of CEO, CXO levels, it's just 2%. That is also a very, very optimistic figure. In many organizations, you don't even have that. What have been the drivers for gender inclusion? In our country, it has been primarily coming from the West. The multinationals who are, who are in the West are trying to bring in the policies and processes that they have for gender inclusion into their organizations here. So the, the Western MNCs have been the ones who brought it. Though in the recent maybe three, four years, we are seeing the Indian MNCs are also working on it <coughs> to proactively increase the gender balance. Um, Another driver has been the war for talent. They want to look at pools of talent beyond the regular male uh, males who are educated. So they are looking for more and more women coming into the pool. A third thing, which has its pros and cons, is where they are saying it's, it's about employer branding. So everybody is doing it, so let's also do it. So we position that we are a very, very gender-friendly organization. The fourth driver is not yet so much visible, but they're saying it at least that if we have, uh, you know, a diverse talent pool, then the competitive edge that we have will be much higher. Though I don't think they are there in terms of leveraging differences so much more. Um, I think there is an ostrich-like mentality that I'm seeing in corporates. They don't even want to. They want to do it very silently. They don't want to talk about the differences. Most times I hear senior leaders coming and saying, for me, men and women are not even different. They are the same. So the movement to first accepting that we are different, we bring different strengths to the table, and then seeing how to leverage those differences, because then it becomes a real business case. Long, long way to go. Um, the glass ceiling, I think somebody was talking about it in the morning discussions, very, very relevant discussions. For me, in the morning, what when I started listening to them, I said, what the work that I'm doing seems to be very different from what I'm seeing. But then slowly it appeared to me, the nuances and the manifestations of this seem to be the same across. Whether it's corporate, you're talking about all the villages of Maharashtra, the nuances are very much the same. Um, the glass ceiling is very much alive very much alive and kicking. Um, there are a lot of people who are saying that we are making a difference. Last 15, 10 years, people have been doing things in corporates. The needle has not moved. There have been lots of conversations. And that's why I found uh, you know, um, Mr. Andrew Fleming's thought about beyond the conferences, what is the action that's being taken? That's very, very important. I think a lot of discussions about gender. But needle has moved? No, it has not moved at all. Um, how are women experiencing glass ceiling and disengagement? As they keep coming to the middle management, see one interesting thing about women in workplaces is till they are about 27, 28, 29, <clears throat> they are very, very performance focused, extremely ambitious, very, very driven. But once complexity hits into their lives, they themselves restrain themselves and the, uh, the environment also starts thinking that perhaps they are not committed. So biases and stereotypes, it starts slowing down. Somewhere, the slowing down happens. And some of the comments, these are just a few that I collected, that we hear from the women that we work with, 
you know, uh, I'm excluded from informal networks. The feminine ways of leading are still not mainstream, even though they keep saying that, you know, women bring different strengths to the table. The moment, for example, empathy is seen as one different strength that women bring to the table, but the moment they become empathic, they display those strengths, they are not seen as leadership material. So, um, or when women express those leader behaviors, they are labeled as aggressive and abrasive. Uh, the biases about why you are so ambitious, even after you have a baby, why don't you go home and you know look after your baby. These are said by senior managers and leaders to women who are committed to workplaces, you know. Ambition is a very bad word. Most recently I heard a CEO who had moved in and the entire management committee uh, was saying, wow, she's just so ambitious, you know. And the question that I asked is, I never heard you saying this about your previous CEO who was a male uh, CEO. So, um, not taken seriously, this keeps coming back where women say that I'm ready, I want to take up this role, but I'm not seen as, no, no, this is, men will do this role better. So these are all very, very alike. It, it is not that it's not there. Most recently I was talking to a very young woman and she was telling me how she feels so isolated and this is an IT company. Because we all think that IT, company, IT companies have really moved far ahead in terms of gender because about 33% they have. And she was telling me how she's isolated and she keeps hearing from the group of, she's the only woman in her team, and how she hears everybody making lewd jokes about her, about the way she dresses and when she tried to, she tries to become, you know, build some rapport with her other team members. Uh, the comments normally are about her character, you know, that, uh, so, so, so all of these, seem to be working in confluence and if I talk about the elements of the glass ceiling, I really think that there is three elements to this glass ceiling, right? It's, it's just not that um, externally it's being thrust on them. I believe the first element of the glass ceiling, and I'm sure most of you know about this, is the socio-cultural element where the sex roles and gender roles, what uh, I think Ame mentioned just now about uh, uh, women have to look after the home, their responsibility is the home, and men have to be the breadwinners, very much there. Uh, the struggle of women who, have, who are CEOs and who still believe intrinsically is the food ready at home. My, my responsibility is to my uh, personal life more than my professional life very much there, not only in the women themselves, but in the environment too. So the division of gender roles, uh, contributing to certain stereotypes and prejudices, very much there and seems to be one element that's holding women back from workplaces, growing in workplaces. Second is the systemic biases, you know. And these systemic biases are more about um, the male models of leadership. That is, uh, there is a lot of research that has been con constructed, with, uh, that, that's been done, which says that uh, think manager, think male. So the competencies, I know one organization we were doing work with and they put up the leadership competencies and we were looking at them. And all the leadership competencies were so, you know, masculine, I won't even say male, I will say masculine, you know, arrogant, very aggressive, impatient. So. When we, when we put that up, even the organization, the stakeholders who were driving diversity and inclusion were very taken aback, you know. And uh, they said, is there a need for us to really rewrite what we mean by leadership competencies? So it's a good thing that they're thinking about it, but, but it's still at a very, very nascent stage. Uh, the third element, which we also do a lot of work with, is the woman herself. How because all of us are children of society, men and women. Women also internalize these same uh, stereotypes and prejudices because from the moment they're born, these have been instilled in them. And they do hold themselves back. Many times after we do these workshops that we uh, run for women leaders, and we just help them surface those, um, you know, inhib uh, not inhibitions, surface those, you know, models that they have in their the mindsets that they have about uh, careers and about personal life, they're quite taken aback themselves. And these mindsets 
manifest in the in the choices and decisions they take in the workplaces. So by the time they reach, say, the middle management, they've held themselves back from those critical roles that would have given them the experience. So even when we are working with organizations which are saying we want to select a pool of women uh, from this middle management and push them up to the next level, they find that these women have really leaned back, so to speak, and have not built the competencies necessary. Uh, so that is a big challenge which we are also addressing. I'll share with you how we partner with organizations on this. Uh, I know I have... I, I, I have just another two slides. Um, so we partner with organizations on three areas. One is helping build women leadership itself. So where we look at two things. How do we retain women? How do we grow women? So for both of these, we offer uh, solutions and uh, initiatives. Second, we also partner with organizations on safe workplaces, that is prevention of sexual harassment. In fact, we are uh, one of the few organizations who are empaneled by the Ministry of Women and Child Development to conduct uh, uh, programs on uh, POSH, as we call it, prevention of sexual harassment. The third one is really the big ticket, which I don't see much movement on, maybe some organizations, which is about creating a gender inclusive ecosystem. More often than not, I'm finding that, you know, we work with the women, uh, we tell them, take charge of your careers, come on, go for and then they go back to the systems and they find that the same mindsets are confronting them. In fact, I've seen some women leave those organizations also. So, uh, inclusive, and we always tell organizations, stop working on bringing in diversity. So many organizations that we see, they have a number, gender ratio, and they say that, you know, we want to bring in 30%, 40% women hiring. And uh, in fact, the MD of an FMCG told me that they brought in about 700 women or women in one year, and within two years, 550 of them left the organization. Because you bring in diversity and there is no inclusion, they won't stay. And that's why our work is more with how will you build a system which is inclusive and automatically people will come in. I think the grapevine is quite powerful there, you know, people will come. So what do we do in inclusive ecosystem? Uh, I've talked about what are the challenges, uh, gender leadership paradigms in terms of looking at what is leadership itself. There are skeptical leader mindsets. Middle management has not bought into this at all. You see the CEOs like your Cyrus Mistry some time back, and uh, uh, you know, Mr. Billa and all of them, they're very, very committed. They say that we would like to change this. But then trickling down, middle managers, no, they are not very convinced about it. And they are the ones who have to make those changes in terms of promotions, in terms of identifying talent that can be promoted. So very skeptical in terms of this whole gender inclusion journey. I've had many very senior leaders who sit in the workshops and tell me, why do we really have to do this? Uh, let us just allow society to evolve the way that it can evolve. It evolves. Why do we have to put all of these initiatives? Quite shocking, actually. Um, and uh, lack of infrastructure post-maternity. We call this the leaking pipeline, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this. When the female talent pipeline, the moment a woman gets married, there is a leak in the pipeline. Women drop off. First child, more women drop off. Second child, you barely have any left. And we all know this. Anecdotally, I'm sure we've all seen this happening. So um, it's very, very difficult in our country to really depend on help post-maternity. Um, and that's a big struggle. Though I see organizations doing work there. I'll talk about that. A uh, lot of systemic biases, lot of manager biases. This is the again the big ticket. What are some of the initiatives that organizations are doing? They are now being quite brave, some of them, and setting actual targets and saying recruitment targets. Fifty percent you have to bring in women. When a woman leaves the organization, they are saying you have to fill this only with another woman in that role. Uh, they are also setting targets for promotion. Because there are unconscious biases that tend to play and people might not 
uh, even promote even pro promotion promotion of women. There are poor processes they've put into place by which um, they say that you know you have to have at least ten percent women that you're proposing for promotion. So they're putting numbers to it. Um, second, there is a tremendous amount of work on manager sensitization to address bias. Very, very different initiatives, not just training. Uh, they are identifying women who have broken stereotypes and giving them a lot of visibility so that those stereotypes and prejudices can be broken. A lot of initiatives that they are trying. Um, flexible working hours, most of the organizations have this now, at least the big ones. Um, daycare centers that are being provided, some of them are doing excellent work where uh, it's not just a daycare center for very, very young infants. They also have office spaces that they have kept. You know what happens when there is a month or once unscheduled holiday and you have your child who's even 11 years, 12 years, 13 years old. You can't leave the child alone at home and come. So they have dedicated office spaces where you can bring your child along and you can work with them. Uh, so, so really different work that they are doing. Extra, extended parental leave. Um, now, of course, Manika Gandhi has uh, made it six months, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and uh, besides that six months, they are also encouraging them to take a little more time off, um, you know, giving many options around that. Um, but again, still a challenge because the moment they start doing all of these things, there is a backlash. Um, and uh, women most often have to face uh, these comments that, you know, you got promoted only because you're a woman. Women themselves resist it because they say, I want to be promoted because of my you know, my caliber rather than because of any diversity numbers. So uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy path. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult one. One thing I'm quite convinced is uh, uh, we will be in business for at least another 40, 50 years because this is going to take some time to change. Uh, the second one is uh, women leadership, which is really what Parity is known for. Uh, it's our flagship programs that we run uh, where there is a limited talent pool. There is tremendous attrition. There is also stagnated growth. You will see a lot of them stagnating at a particular point for whatever reasons. So we work with them. We offer mentoring. We offer coaching to really help them reorient certain certain mindsets that they myself they themselves might have built, uh, motivating them to move forward. So uh, for attraction, retention, and growth, several kinds of initiatives that we. That we run uh, so that the gender balance does not get too skewed. There are efforts, but we have still not been able to see very, very clear impact on all of this. Uh, and I think this goes back again to the again to the ecosystem that I was talking about earlier. Uh, again, the uh, challenges in doing this is you know you have fast track programs where they identify 20, 30 women. We work with them over a period of a year to help them grow to the next level. And then there is uh, this, uh, uh, comments from the system about um, that's not very inclusive. Why are you doing that only to women? Why are you not doing it to men? So there is a lot of challenges even here, but still they are persisting and they are doing a lot of work here too. The safe workplace is a bit, I'm, I'm really very happy with the act, uh, the Posh Act, though it's a bit draconian, uh, much needed, much, much needed. 2013, after Nirbhaya, the law was passed. Before that, Vishaka guidelines was there. Um, but now I see organizations pulling up their, you know, shoelaces and setting it up. Um, but trying very hard to do the basic, basic minimum. Where, when you actually go and see, there is sexual harassment is pretty rampant. Uh, from the very serious cases, like one young girl who moved from Delhi to Bangalore. And uh, after an off-site party, one of her senior leaders asked her to uh, come out to a pub. And then the next thing she knows is she gets up in the morning, she doesn't know what hit her. Um, and she raised a complaint. She was totally exploited. Two cases like where they have, there are a lot of jokes that are going around, lewd conversations. Uh, quite, uh, quite rampant, actually. Um, and many of them still don't raise complaints. You know, 90% of women still do not raise complaints because of the stigma attached to it. Uh, very limited. I'm so surprised that large organizations, women don't know about this. What is the redressal mechanism? Uh, 
I don't. I would like to think it's not deliberate, but but I but somehow organizations don't seem to be uh, generating the awareness that listen, if you are feeling unsafe, let us know. They don't know there is a policy. They don't know how to reach out. Uh, again, of course, there are handful of organizations that are doing fantastic work, fantastic work, really, which is which makes you feel very very hopeful, but majority of them very reluctant to even set up the committees, the policies, or even uh, you know building awareness because they are afraid that if they build awareness, people might uh, raise too many complaints. Um, initiatives, yes, compliance, uh, risk management, risk mitigation, they are doing, they are trying to set up those committees. Um, some of them are prioritizing safety. They are saying that's the most important thing, especially organizations which have a large number of women. 50, 60 percent that they have women, they are really going all out to say that we are a safe workplace, please come and join. Because it then becomes a business case for them. They really need to attract more female talent. Um, also, increasing voices of women against sexual harassment, they are encouraging them to report the whole Me Too movement. There is definitely more. Uh, more women, especially in the younger generation, are willing to come out and raise complaints, which is again a wonderful thing and we encourage that. Um, that is very, very briefly the work that uh, we do. Uh, I think um, it's, it's very tough in 15, 20 minutes to talk about all the work that we do. I myself have partnered with more than 50 organizations uh, in this miles to go, miles to go. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions later if required. Thank you.